All right, well, thank you guys for coming uh, to the Stump, the bartender. Thank you, David, for that wonderful, uh, hey, no wonderful title. I've already been stumped. I've already asked for an apple teeny. <laughs> <laughs> well, that would be this conference a completely different conference. Yeah, <laughs> indeed. So um, I'll let David talk because this is his session. I'm just kind of here to answer any SHSUE type of questions as well. And uh, my intention was to keep this relatively informal and uh, more of a dialogue. I can certainly sit here and show you Blackboard Learn all day. Um, I've been known to go way over. Um, the, I was really pleased when I looked at my watch at the end of the last session and said, oh, and we're right on time. <laughs> uh, so I guess the, the first question is, is how many of you are, uh, I guess you're, you're all actively using the platform. Um, how many of you, how long, how, who's been using the platform for? Just so far, they aren't. They don't. They don't officially get loaded in the learn until the fifth. Right, the new one. Right? Right. 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 Okay. So, how many of you been using the old one for three, more than three years? Okay. And uh, uh, what are some of the things that immediately come to mind as concerns as you're migrating into the new platform? It's not bright, entertaining, attractive. Ah. Yes, it, it, it isn't who though. That's true. It's boring. Mm -hmm. I mean, that is, is that changing with this one? Well, it doesn't dance. I've been trying to get it to. Um, it does, uh, it will have a mobile app, although that will come in the spring. Yeah. Um, so there'll be <coughs> native application access on mobile devices. Um, what sort of things are you looking for when you think about it? Because, I mean, obviously... It is, is that its opening page? That is my demo server's opening page. Yeah, That's sure. what I mean by boring. There's no... You know, <coughs> students want to be engaged. No, they want to be entertained. That's different. <laughs> they want that, too. You know, um, I mean, there's no pictures, there's... Well, that's entirely up to you. This, uh, up to the institution. Um, there are different things that people are doing. Um, get back my navigation tool bar. Um, People do different things with their platform. So what you can do with it is you can do a lot of things. I mean, they've got some pictures here. I was trying to think of what it had, you know, more of a graphic approach. It has a lot to do with what the institution chooses to do with it. There's an enormous amount of flexibility in what appears in these boxes. Theirs used to have more pictures on it. They've apparently gone all texty on it. Um, but uh, you know how what you end up doing within your course or within the environment is, uh, is driven a lot by you. Um, so you know, what, what sort of content's appropriate, what do you want to have in here? Uh, the, in addition, we've got uh, themes that you can change so that your course looks distinct as your course. So they don't all look exactly the same when you go in, which can help a little bit with the engagement issue of, of knowing I'm inside the right course, right? Um, so here I've picked a kind of a mosaic theme that looks a little bit uh, Renaissance uh, oriented for my Tudor Dynasty course. Um, if, meanwhile, if I flip over to uh, uh, my biology course, uh, it takes on a different look and feel. Um, has uh, double helixes in the background and uh, uh, use, use a different theme. So there's some things that we've got built in and then beyond that, uh, lots of tools for you to include media in the course. So if I move into a particular area within the course, um, like in this case, the chapter one intro, um, I have uh, audio built in. With the audio introduction to the chapter in this case, et 
except this particular machine doesn't have. <coughs> stuff for that. Do you have a browser preference? Um, my preference is Chrome, but Firefox is my second choice. Um, we support Internet Explorer, Firefox, and Chrome on Windows platform, and uh, Firefox, Chrome, and Safari on the Mac platform. Um, Safari also works fine on Windows, but it's not officially, we don't test it or anything on Windows. Um, it's unusual that anybody uses it. The, um, uh, when I say support with Firefox and Chrome, as you may know, they are updating those platforms every three weeks or so. It's just amazing how fast they're just, they're iterating constantly. So as a result, we've kind of thrown in the towel on what version we support. We support the most recent stable uh, release channel, like not a beta, but the most recent typical channel. And so what that means is you may run into occasional snags on one of those platforms where something weird happens because they just released a new something. And uh, uh, you know the team here would submit a ticket to us. We will take it, we'll say yes, we'll work on that, we'll fix it as best we can, as fast as we can. But it hasn't come up much. For the most part, everything just is ticking along just fine, in my experience and from what I'm hearing from people. Um, I particularly like Chrome, I think it's fast. I understand that the IT department here does not like it, so you won't see it on an official Sam Houston machine, but you might see it on a student machine. Firefox is also a good choice. Internet Explorer, your mileage may vary. Um, Microsoft tends to be a little funky about the way they implement certain standards like JavaScript and the way they handle it. So every now and then we get some weirdness with Internet Explorer. I hear more about Internet Explorer problems than I do many other of the other platforms. And by problems, I usually don't mean any sort of showstopper. I mean something weird, like you go to the screen to build a calculated column in your grade center, and one of these button things is suddenly this big, instead of the usual size, because of the way the particular browser's implementing the JavaScript and uh, dealing with it. So, Little things, usually not anything big. I haven't heard anything big recently. One, one problem I frequently have with the current whiteboard is just when I'm typing in an announcement, sometimes it will put in all the code underneath there. I don't, I certainly didn't put it in there. Mm -hmm. and if I change browsers, it seems to help, but it's not uh, predictable for me. When, when it converts your WYSIWYG, kind of like what it's supposed to look like, and then it turns it into HTML, and if it does something weird somewhere in between there? Yeah, I mean, I'll just type in an announcement into the announcement, mm -hmm. but when I click it up, it's got all this underlying code, and mm -hmm. it's confusing. We, we do have, uh, and by the time, let's see, by spring, certainly, I would imagine, it has to be on the server back down. With the, uh, well, let me pause for a moment and say something about service packs because I think it's, it's important, particularly from a faculty perspective, so that you, when you hear this, you know what's going on. Um, this big kerfuffle you're going through of uh, moving from the old version to the new version is kind of the way things have been done. And we've spent 10 years doing this where we, we, if you want something new, like new technology, new capabilities, new functionality, you have to wait two, three years. Um, then at the end of the two, three years, you and everybody else has to go through this big kerfuffle of moving from this platform to this one, and it's usually a big change. All the buttons moved, everything's different, because of course the two or three years of development have gone on in the middle. So what we're doing now is a service pack approach where we're trying to address both of these, these, these challenges. One of them is I want things new. I want to stay on top of the latest technologies. And the other one is I really don't want to have my entire world turned upside down every you know, three months, right? So every quarter we release a service pack, so the four year, and there will be no big new version of Blackboard, hopefully ever. We might one day, marketing might decide to stop calling it 9.1, call it 10 or something, but you know, this is just labels, right? Um, it will just be another service pack. And so as we release these service packs, there are four year, and uh, all of them include uh, maintenance, and so bug fixes, that sort of thing, you know, it doesn't work the way it's supposed to. And uh, enhancements, so little adjustments. A 
an example of an enhancement is in Service Pack 8, or I'm sorry, Service Pack 9, we released um, a, the ability of the rubric to evaluate across a percent range. So you say this particular category is worth uh, 25%, this one's worth 50%, this one's worth 100% of whatever the point values are, right? And then you can use the same rubric in multiple assignments. So that, that little addition to the rubric, we already had the rubric, but just that little enhancement, that's an enhancement. It doesn't turn anybody's world upside down. You're not even gonna notice if you didn't care about that, right? So uh, those odd numbered service packs, two of the service packs, typically, you know, these are the odd numbers right now, um, are very low impact. You know, the, the team would install that service pack over a break, uh, uh, some low level break in the semesters, and you might get a notice that says, oh, by the way, there are percent ranges in your rubric exam. Some people go, yay, and everybody else will go, whatever. And the even-numbered service packs also include new features and new functionality. So when service pack eight came out, we got this uh, new look and feel that's a little cleaner, sharper look. You'll notice that I have edit mode on, and, but I don't see any of the controls uh, all cluttering up my screen. So, you know, bigger changes, a little more noticeable, uh, Service Pack 8 also had some feature functionality things like uh, the ability to auto regrade when you have a, a test question that was uh, flawed. And you say, oh, well, the test, the publisher sent me this test bank, and unsurprisingly, they accidentally checked the wrong one as correct. So now you can go through and just correct it and instantly regrade everybody's exam. Or delete the item and say it was never there, pretend it was never there, and adjust everybody's scores accordingly. So there are different ways you can handle it. New feature, new functionality came with Service Pack 8. So the service packs keep rolling forward, new things come out, but instead of getting this big, huge kerfuffle like you're in the midst of now, you'll get an email from Jacob's team that says, hey, we're going to Service Pack 10. Here are the five things that you're going to notice that you're going to care about. And if you want to know more, let us know, because there were 10 things in the background that you don't even notice. But, uh, but that's the idea, is to kind of iteratively move forward. So one of the things that's coming to that massive introduction is uh, to your point about, you know, I go in and edit, and I have these problems when I edit, weird things happen. Uh, the inline editor that is coming in Service Pack 10 is the new one. It's been field tested all this last uh, uh, semester, actually all through the spring of uh, last spring semester and into the summer. We were field testing it in actual universities with actual students, faculty, and staff and with about 30 volunteer institutions. The new editor has round trip HTML editing. It's much more robust. You're going to have a lot more, a lot fewer of those kind of funky things. Like right now in the current editor, um, you have to, if you want a blank line, you need to put a space in it. Otherwise it just zips it up for you. Yeah. And sometimes the fonts will like do some funky things where you're like, I did not tell it to like make it this big. Um, especially this big and this big and this big and this big, yep. So some of that has to do with uh, earlier, it's an earlier version of, a, of an inline text editor, so a visual text editor. So the new one is coming, and that's gonna make a huge difference, and again, it'll be something that if you start using the platform this fall, you're not going to see it, uh, you'll see the editor that's in the new platform, which I think is newer than the one you've been using. Yes. And then, um, but then in the spring, you're gonna see the, uh, the new text editor will appear and the buttons will be different, and, but fundamentally you're, you're going to be happy with the way it works. And let me speak to that process. Uh, part of what we did when we purchased Blackboard is we actually now have, with Blackboard on campus, we just have Blackboard. We don't have test Blackboard, we don't have development Blackboard, we just have Blackboard. And so what we had to do is essentially take the whole thing down and we didn't do anything, right? Well now we've got three separate instances of Blackboard that we have. We have Blackboard test, Blackboard staging, and then Blackboard production. So what we will do is Blackboard staging will actually have, a, essentially be an exact copy of what's in production. It'll have all the live data, it'll have everything that you have on it for all the students and all that stuff so that we wanna test and upgrade, we can run through with everything on it so we'll know immediately if there's a problem. You guys don't even know that it's a problem because the real server will be out there, the students will be interacting with it. We have what's called a complex hosting manager who will actually test the upgrade six different times and let us know how long it's gonna to take to do the upgrade. So we can say, okay, well, this will take 20 minutes or this will take whatever. 
And, and in that way, what we've done is we've essentially gotten out of the process of, well, we're going to take Blackboard. We really don't know how long it's going to be down. You know, it's one of those things. We just have to figure out when we get there. We'll already know. The process will be simple. It will be streamlined. We'll already know that it worked. And we can move straight through it. Yes, sir. Well, it'd be easy to transfer like quizzes and exams in the previous version of Blackboard to the new version. Yes. Okay. All of that will simply come over. I agree. Uh, the, uh, you shouldn't see any significant degradation. There might be some little tweaky things on the edges, but uh, but certainly like your quizzes and exams should all come over intact. And then you can start building cool new new items. There are 17 right. different item types in the platform. Um, Quiz bowl! Yay! <laughs> uh, to the question of uh, kind of creating a certain level of uh, engaging interactivity, in the uh, in the platform, you have the ability to build lots of content. So uh, uh, you can build your own content. You can integrate with the publishers. If if you're working with McGraw Hill or Pearson or Wiley or Cengage or uh, Macmillan, you'll be able to. If you're working with some of their digital advanced digital tools, you'll be able to uh, set up a link between your course in Blackboard and your section over in their system and the students will move smoothly back and forth. And uh, in most cases, like McGraw, Hills, Engage, uh, Wiley, the grades will just automatically flow back. So uh, if, if you're working with any of those discipline-specific tools that are uh, uh, interactive, um, the, uh, the, you'll have to be able to very quickly set up a link between them. Um, you've got the uh, mashup concept in play. Uh, mashups are aggregating sites like YouTube, SlideShare, Flickr. Um, we built those three as proof of concept and then we put together a programming interface so that all these other people can start to use it. So you'll see this list of mashups increase over time as, uh, as uh, Sam Houston starts to add capabilities into the platform. For example, you'll see voice authoring here, which is part of the Blackboard Collaborate uh, voice authoring tool. So I can click on that, it pops up a window, I can record something, immediately saves it into the system. Uh, NBC content has already built theirs. Uh, Kaltura has a, a mashup. Uh, ShareStream has a mashup. So these different tools and capabilities that the university will pick up will show up and add to your collection of things that you can do inside your course in a way of building content. You'll see that uh, audio, images, uh, uh, video, web link, these sorts of things, many of these are in any kind of content can be loaded up into the system. Now some things are going to be better used somewhere else. You know, if it's a great big huge video file, you can load it up here, but it really needs to be on a streaming server like YouTube or Kaltura. It'll go to Kaltura. Kaltura. You're, well, you use Kaltura. So you'll uh, put it up on your Kaltura server here on campus and then just use the building block to just link it into the course. Uh, but here you'll see where I put in an audio or an image link. In many cases, I, uh, I see that so that uh, you know, if I put in an audio file, um, I have the option, there are special options for those when they appear in, in, inside. And that's why they're called out. It's not that we are particular about what kind of file you need to use. It's that some files have a particular manifestation. I might want to add a transcript in for my audio. I might want to auto start, loop, add alignments, etc. Uh, the question of accessibility is an important one and one we take pretty seriously. So there's a free course that uh, you all can load up and make available um, and uh, an entire website dedicated to this topic at blackboard.com on uh, making your content accessible. The platform's very accessible. It's got gold certification, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, from uh, appropriate people like the National Federation of the Blind. But uh, once you put content in, you could easily, and usually accidentally, put a content in that, so when you do have a student who's using a screen reader, they're like, um, I have no idea what that is. So there are some tricks and tips uh, that you can uh, adopt for that sort of thing. Uh, at this point, I'm kind of randomly moving can through. We, can pieces. we show us a little bit of the uh, inline grading where you can actually look at items while you're? Yes. So when we move into a particular area, let's go back to our Tudor Dynasty course. And um, 
First of all, just in terms of the navigation, I mentioned this earlier today, but uh, this navigation is very flexible and can be anything that you need it to be. Um, it can be very simple, it can be very complex. Um, you can add additional items into the navigation by simply saying, oh, here, let me give me a, uh, a subheader and we'll call it uh, Course Tools. And, uh, and then I can just quickly click and drag that to wherever I want it to be. Um, like I said, well, you know, I want to put a second divider in there. So I'll just add that divider in. And then, uh, and that's what the students would see. Um, in addition, I can hide and unhide items. So this is a hidden item, the students don't see it. And uh, I can manage those items by just dropping down the link right here. Um, so that when we go into the student view and turn edit mode off, you'll see those disappear. Um, managing that navigation, again, very simple and straightforward so that you can make it be what you need for the particular course in question. So that if I you know, move to my midterm course, it has a different uh, navigation appropriate to that class. If I go into a uh, simple empty course that just started out, I might have a very simple navigation, uh, and so on. You'll see when you get into Blackboard on the 15th that we've actually, essentially just to keep things to where you're familiar with it, we've almost mimicked the old Blackboard's tools on the left just so you can see them. Ultimately, we'll deal with best practices and what you can do differently, but we want to make sure you had a little bit of familiarity when, we act, when you actually go into a blank course. So it's going to have the same kind of sense, but we actually are leveraging the dividers in there now and, and dividing up the areas. The, uh, when I'm inside a particular lesson, if I, uh, one of the tools that I can take advantage of here are uh, the interactive tools. So discussion boards, blogs, journals, and wikis. Discussion boards are very familiar with, old style tool used to be the only thing we had that would do any sort of interactivity back in the day. Now we have blogs, which is an article with commentary. You can be the only person writing in the blog, you can uh, have students building blogs, you can have students in groups working with blogs. Uh, journals are just like blogs, except in this case, typically the student's going to write the article and it's just between you and the student. So nobody else sees what the student is writing. It's just between them and the instructor. The, uh, the wiki, of course, is the collaborative environment where we're going to be working together in, uh, in, as a group to put things together. So for example, in my uh, fictitious uh, history course here, I've asked the students to uh, build a study guide for the War of the Roses. And they're supposed to pull together materials and resources that they have that uh, help them to study up for this particular <coughs> unit. Um, it does look suspiciously like Wikipedia, um, so I'm sure we'll have to have a conversation about plagiarism. And uh, uh, and it's it's a pretty lengthy document that's been uh, <coughs> copied and pasted into this particular environment in place. As the instructor, I want to be able to take a look at participation grading. So. What we're trying to do as much as possible, and we're going to continue to refine this over time, we're looking for feedback all the time. So blackboard.com slash feedback, anytime that you see something and you say, gee, I wish this worked differently, I wish this had some other tool, I'd like this to be improved in such and such a way, please tell us. We, everything that comes into feedback, blackboard.com slash feedback is indexed, put into categories, it's like voting. So if you're really passionate about it, have all your students stuff the ballot box. Um, here we've got an overview of participation in this particular uh, wiki. You'll get a similar sort of overview, but specific to blogs, journals, and discussion boards. The, um, as I'm looking through this, I can see that I've got uh, several students who participated. <coughs> if I uh, notice that, uh, for example, uh, uh, Cardinal Wolves has got a lot to say, Michael is apparently having trouble with his uh, English. If we uh, click on Tycho, and take a quick look at his participation, uh, we can see that he's modified X number of words on particular dates. I can compare versions. So I can compare version 11 with version 10. Looks like he edited and then went back in and edited again. And uh, as I scroll down, I can see exactly what Tycho did between these two versions. 
So if he's been deleting things, adding things, if he's just been uh, going from version to version, adding and deleting the Gettysburg Address, uh, well, that, you know, consequences will be needed now. And, uh, and say, well, where are the consequences? Well, for that, I might move this over and grab a hold, and I want to start evaluating his performance. So I can just give him a raw grade and some commentary. I can uh, go into a full text editor and add links and videos and whatever else I want to add in terms of comments back to the student. Um, I can also use a rubric. So in this case, when I set up this assignment, this wiki, I, have set, I set, attached a rubric to it. I can look at the rubric in a separate page and uh, go through and pick the particular uh, point spread that I want for each category. Um, and it adds up the scores, and then I can override it if I had some reason to, I, you know, some extra credit or whatever it is I'm going to do. I can give feedback, and then uh, I can uh, make notes to myself about what I saw here and why I gave that grade. Um, I can also, the funny thing about rubrics is after a while you don't need all the explanation, you remember what all your categories were. You don't need to be reminded. So uh, we can move even faster by simply keeping it right here in line. So now I can just zip through and indicate what I think about Tycho's contribution here and uh, how many points for each category, whatever it is I built into my rubric. Um, we have sessions on rubric already listed um, on our training schedule, so if you really want to know about it. It is uh, 48 after. Uh, the session is scheduled to end at a quarter after, or maybe a quarter before. Lunch starts at 12, but I figure if we can wait now just ask for specific questions and try to get you out of here when you want to, uh, that would be good. So does anybody have any specific questions? Yes, Tom? sir. I've got a simpler mind thing, just trying to figure out if my students even go to Blackboard and look at the assignments. There's a, there's a performance a, a dashboard or something. There are several things but in the evaluation the section. Insist that they go and look at my announcements or my quizzes, and since they're doing it in some sort of quirky way, it doesn't show up in the. Mm. It doesn't show up that Billy Bob has really been to quiz one. I see. And, and I hate to call them liars. Right. Uh, but the performance dashboard seems not in the old version wasn't as reliable. I wasn't as confident. Mm -hmm. Really telling me that they were right. Um, in addition to the performance dashboard, which is still there, uh, whether or not you know a specific uh, quirkiness that was existed before has been remediated, I would hope so, but I would have to get in, dig into the weeds on that one. But uh, in addition to that, we also have a uh, uh, student activity report. And when we run this report, we can start to drill down into a particular student, and I'm probably going to pick someone who doesn't actually have any activity. Um, let's see if Anne's been busy. Yeah. Uh, let's see if she's lost her head yet. And uh, run this particular report. The, the thing about this is there are best practices that you can adopt when you're actually putting your course together that will help you leverage these tools. So for example, one of the things that uh, tracking data, you can have that little, yes, I want to track data on this item. If you just do it on one of your document pages and you just track the items, even if they just pull those up just by looking at that page, it says they looked at them. So your best bet is to start to think about from an organizational structure, let's put these items in a folder, or let's set a mark review status on these. And these are things that I think we can address in just you and I talking that will really help you leverage those tools. So uh, there, there's a lot of ways that we can make sure that that data that you're looking for is real and true and hard data that your students can't argue against. So we can see that Ann Boleyn primarily works on Tuesdays. She's done a little <laughs> bit on Thursday. She's, she's not in the weekends. Um, she's uh, spent an average, uh, total time in the course is nine hours. Um, she's spent an average time of two to about three hours. Um, total number of items is nine. She's logged in 25 times. Um, she last logged in in July. Um, like I said, she's been having trouble with her uh, uh, head. So we've got uh, all assignments. She's been, how much time has she spent here? How much time has she spent on the essay assignment? 
uh, the exam, and so on. So this is a way of tracking what has happened. Another way of proactively approaching it is to look at, um, at the uh, adaptive release capability. So with adaptive release, and this is getting into more of the advanced details, we can go into a particular area and we can indicate, for example, that you may not see the lesson one on the War of the Roses until you have done something, right? This is where I was talking about earlier where we have the ability in these digital tools right. to start to identify gaps. And there are different ways you can do that, and it takes a little bit of structure and planning in order to uh, take advantage of the tools, because there's no way to automatically get it done ahead of time. But here I could say it has to be a date, you have to be a member of a particular group, so I can use those groups like special testing if I wanted to deploy a test that they only see if they're in this group. So uh, there are ways of, of managing that. Here I can indicate if you've gotten a particular grade on a particular assignment. So I could build little bitty quizzes that only have one question and create a sense of branching within the course. Um, a real simple one is review status. Here I'm saying that you have to actually acknowledge my office hours policy by clicking the little radio button. Now is this magic? Does this mean they actually read it? Of course not. But at least you've got something that you can say, look, you said you read it. If you didn't, it's your lookout, right? Don't come proud to me. Because you said you did, and if you didn't say you did, then you wouldn't have seen anything we've done in the course since then, right? And you can go through the performance dashboard and course reports and see what's the status of people's adaptive release. Can they actually see things? Any other questions? There's a lot here. Um, the, feel free to follow me on Twitter, send me emails. Um, definitely start here, because there's only you know, one, one or really two of me, if you count Scott, who's over on the East Coast. And, uh, but uh, definitely, if you've got something challenging, we'd love to hear it, and the feedback is always desired.